and we'll begin the sitter class pretty soon. So we've said our hellos and let's get into it. So today we're on page 58 for those who have the wonderful book. And uh, it's amazing. We've done a third or so of the chapter on anger. We've got two thirds or so left, maybe slightly less. And it's a very fruitful subject. I think it's obviously one of these core kind of hindrances to meditation from which the others stem in a way. And lots of different ways we can actually work with it to undermine and overcome anger because it's a, a defilement of the mind that does create a lot of suffering for ourselves and obviously for others. So I'd like to get straight into it, but just quickly recap that last week, we were on the Sutta Anguttara 5162. And the excerpt that Bhikkhu Bodhi has written here starts with the Venerable Sariputta addressing the monks and saying that there are these five ways of removing resentment by which one should entirely remove resentment when it's arisen toward anyone. So the first was that when a person's bodily behavior is impure, but their verbal behavior is pure. And then the example there was given that one sees a rag on the roadside and we take off the good part and uh, keep the good part, basically. So that means we focus on the person's, um, in this case, verbal behavior and not their bodily behavior, which is impure. And then the second one was when a person's verbal behavior is impure, but the bodily behavior is pure. Yeah, and then that example given there was like the pond with algae. So we remove the algae, we clear the pond so that we can drink clean water in the same way we focus on the person's bodily behavior. And then the third one was when both were impure, but from time to time, one gains an opening of mind. And that was the one where we get down on all fours and we try to drink from a kind of puddle and we have to... Um, get down there with cupped hands and try not to disturb the water so that we can actually quench our thirst. And uh, yeah, the depiction was to suck it up like a cow. And somebody wrote that in the chat box, which is very evocative and quite easy to remember, isn't it? <laughs> suck, it suck up that water that you can drink like a cow and depart. So the fourth one is what we'll start with today. And there are two extremes in a sense because both are when a person's bodily and verbal behavior are completely impure and then the last one is when they're both pure so these are two opposites and also situations which are a little bit more extreme where it's not so easy to focus on one aspect of the person so there are different methods here and the first one very much points towards compassion and I think that if we read it in that light we can get a really good example of um how compassion can be expressed, you know, the kind of words, the kind of thoughts we might have that are basically geared towards compassion. So I'll begin there. It's number four in this, uh, the fourth paragraph in this excerpt. So are we ready? Yeah, ready, ready, ready. So how, friends, should resentment be removed toward the person whose bodily and verbal behavior are impure? and who do not gain an opening of the mind, placidity of the mind from time to time. So here's the answer. Suppose a sick, afflicted and gravely ill person was traveling along a highway and the last village behind them and the next village ahead of them were both far away. <clears throat> they would not obtain suitable food and medicine nor a qualified attendant. They would not get to meet the leader of the village district. Another person traveling on the highway might see that person and arouse sheer compassion, sympathy, and tender concern for them, thinking, oh, may this person obtain suitable food, suitable medicine, and a qualified attendant. May they get to meet the leader of the village district. For what reason? So that this man or this person does not encounter calamity and disaster right here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So too, when a person's bodily and verbal behavior are impure and they do not gain an opening, gain from time to time an opening of the mind, placidity of the mind, on that occasion one should arouse sheer compassion, sympathy, and tender concern for them, 
thinking, oh, may this venerable one abandon bodily misbehavior and develop good bodily behavior. May they abandon verbal misbehavior and develop good verbal behavior. May they abandon mental misbehavior and develop good mental misbehavior. So they've added the mental here. For what reason? So that with the breakup of the body after death, they will not be reborn in the plane of misery, in a bad destination, in the lower world, or in hell. In this way, resentment toward that person should be removed. So I'd quite like to pause here because there's quite a bit here to unpack and obviously some really lovely ways of thinking about a person who we can't see any goodness in or whose bodily and verbal behavior are very harmful. And we don't see that their mind ever becomes still or peaceful or pleasant even. So it's really defiled. I don't like the word defiled, but it's dirtied, we could say. It's kind of obscured. It's um, full of suffering and full of uh, the distortions of perception. And we're to see this person as a sick person, someone who's afflicted and gravely ill. So that would feel quite different, right? If we understand that this person's sick and in a way, perhaps you can say that sickness is not somebody's fault and oh, their bodily and behavior, verbal behavior is their responsibility, is their, in a sense, fault. It's you know up to them to change it, but is it really? Yeah, is it really, or is it some kind of sickness? Um, perhaps through misfortune in life, perhaps through not encountering the teachings, not encountering good examples of purity of mind, yeah, through not really having another way or being really confused, really stuck in this negativity. And in this case, uh, it talks about not obtaining suitable food and medicine. So that could be seen as the Dhamma, right? Suitable food or medicine or a qualified attendant, somebody to nurse them, somebody to take care of them. Yeah. And they would not get to meet the leader of the village district. So, of course, we don't normally do that anymore. <laughs> but um, this gives a sense that they would be protected, right? They would actually know where to go. They would maybe be made comfortable. They would be introduced to other people in the village. And in this case, this person's very much left to their own devices. They're very much alone without any help basically. And another person sees that and thinks, may they have that help, that food, medicine, the attendant. So they don't encounter calamity and disaster right there. And what's really nice in this case is that it talks about abandoning mental misbehavior too, to develop good mental behavior. Because of course, if one's speech and mind, sorry, speech and bodily behavior, uh, um, let's say, uh, unskillful and harmful towards oneself and others, it's surely coming from a, a mind that is unwell. So any questions or comments or things that you'd like to feed back on this passage? I'd also like to just point out those lovely words, arousing sheer compassion, sympathy and tender concern. So sheer compassion in this case, I think is probably the karuna. I'm not sure what sheer would be, but you know, just pure compassion, nothing but compassion, no judgment, right? No judgment. And then that sympathy. Again, I'm not quite sure which Pali word it is, but the tender concern, either the sympathy or the tender concern is surely anukampa. So it's that real sense of looking upon a person almost as, you know, a sick child in a way. So not somebody to be feared, but somebody to feel compassion toward. So in this way, resentment toward that person should be removed. So I shall continue if there's no comments or questions. Yeah. So the next paragraph is interesting because it's about somebody with pure bodily and verbal behavior. And even then we can sometimes have resentment, <laughs> maybe jealousy as well. So how friends should resentment be removed toward the person whose bodily and verbal behavior are pure and from time to time gains an opening of the mind, placidity of the mind. 
Suppose there were a pond with clear, sweet, cool water, clean and smooth banks, a delightful place shaded by various trees. Then a person might arrive afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty and parched. So that's, of course, the person with the resentment. You're burning, you're oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty and parched. Having plunged into the pond, they would bathe and drink. And then after coming out, they would sit or lie down in the shade of a tree right there. So too, when a person's bodily and verbal behavior are pure, and from time to time one gains an opening of mind, placidity of mind, on that occasion one should attend to their pure bodily behavior, to their pure verbal behavior, and to the opening of the mind, the placidity of the mind that they gain from time to time. In this way, resentment toward that person should be removed. Friends, by means of a person who inspires confidence in every way, the mind gains confidence. These friends are the five ways of removing resentment by means of which a person can entirely remove resentment toward whomever it has arisen. So here we can see all kinds of people, nobody's excluded. And I think this is such a beautiful uh, simile you know, the idea that we're particularly perhaps hot, weary, thirsty and parched if we're having so much anger even towards such a good person, such a noble person. And then we approach that person and we can, by focusing on their beautiful behavior, it's almost like a practice of mudita, isn't it? Of rejoicing in their goodness rather than feeling jealous or angry about that and using it to our advantage because we can actually develop wholesome states of mind in this case. And when we're plunging into that beautiful water, you know, and getting our thirst quenched and bathing and drinking that water is almost like drinking our own beautiful mental states, our own correct ways of relating to that person. So we can not only in a way partake of their goodness, but we can actually refresh ourselves by reflecting on that, you know, by rejoicing in that rather than having any sort of jealousy or maybe just irritation that can obviously come up with anybody, right? I know that I can get irritated sometimes even with my teachers if I'm in that kind of mood. <laughs> People even got irritated. I mean, angry, actually, and very jealous and hostile towards the, the Buddha. His own cousin, Devadatta, tried to kill him. And he had other enemies as well. You know, it's hard to imagine, isn't it, by, that somebody radiating so much compassion and purity and peace could actually have enemies. And yet when they came into contact with him, they could actually start to tune up to that goodness inside the Buddha. You know, usually he spoke to them in very calm and beautiful, compassionate ways, and they calmed right down. And then I like this little bit about um, coming out of that lake and then sitting or lying down in the shade of a tree right by that lake. It's almost like the anger has been placated and then we want to stay around that person. We want to sit by them. It feels good to be in their presence. It feels relaxing and easeful. And certainly my experience most of the time, if not all of the time with my teachers and even with really good friends is that you just want to be with them. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you have nothing to say. Um, you just want to sit because you feel relaxed there. You feel um, unjudged. You feel accepted fully. Yeah, it's the same as if you're with your very loving mother. You feel accepted, you feel comfortable. You just want to be with her, even if, or your father, even if they're not, even if they're watching terrible TV, which often happens here, <laughs> in my perception, in my judgment, you know. <laughs> not really trashy TV, but still it's very loud, you know, because they're both getting hard of hearing. But sometimes I just want to be with them anyway, because I feel a sense of badness to be around them you know, remembering that they've done so much to support me in my life, even though they're not perfect, I'm not perfect. You know, we've had our struggles, but still, it's nice to spend time together and just be with each other, even without sometimes uttering many words at all. And I've seen at Bodhinyana, I mean, I've done it myself, if I'm feeling a bit agitated, I just go up to where Ajahn Brahm's meeting the guests, you know, after lunch, and I don't have any reason to be there other than to just sit there and soak in the metta. And he's quite happy with that. There's usually many other people doing the same thing. 
so it's always very nice just a very nice atmosphere so we can actually soak in and take shade in that tree of a great person with deep roots in the dhamma so I guess that's pretty self-explanatory, but if uh, there are any questions or comments, please do write them in the box or raise your hand if you wish. Otherwise, we shall continue. Okay, so someone's saying, but it would still require the intention to overcome jealousy and resentment to someone pure. If one wants to be resentful, one will always find a way. Absolutely, yeah. And perhaps in this case, you know, the person has to first understand that they're afflicted and oppressed by the heat, weary, thirsty and parched. Because sometimes people find pleasure in feeling hot, feeling angry. You know, it actually um, consolidates the sense of self, right? We feel alive. We feel like, yeah, we have a strong opinion or we have like a passion against something, right? Yeah, I mean, this happens a lot when, say, watching the news and hearing perspectives that are really against our own. And we're like, yeah, no, this is terrible, blah, blah, blah. And we don't want to drop that. You know, sometimes I say to people, like, do you actually want to get agitated or would you rather watch something uplifting? <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes they say, actually, no, I'm, I'm, I'm watching this, <laughs> even though they're feeling really angry with the television or the commentators on the cricket match, still, they want to watch it because it gives a kind of, uh, a kind of fire, a kind of energy, as you're rightly saying in the chat box there. Yeah. So I think in the beginning, it does mean we sort of understand that we're feeling weary and parched and hot. But sometimes when we come into contact with somebody with a very different vibration, that also helps us realize that we're off track. And the understanding of our own mental state can come at that moment, right? It can come there and then, and then suddenly we realize, oh, there's a different way. And suddenly we can start to resonate with a different kind of vibration or energetic um, resonance in a way. So someone else is saying, it appears that one needs a lot of mental energy and wisdom and stillness of mind to be able to calm to be able to calm and with lots of meta to deal with these scenarios. How does one maintain such mental energy? Yeah, I guess it's at this stage when we're training on the path, you know, we're not going to maintain it. So I think first of all, being realistic and being really accepting and, and understanding of yourself that sometimes you won't have that meta, you won't have the energy, wisdom or stillness of mind, but that's okay, you know, you can forgive yourself for that. But then there will be other times that that will arise. And I think like with anything on the path, it's to do with uh, regular practice to just persistently and consistently coming back to thoughts of loving kindness, to thoughts of um, well-being for others, you know, even using your mind in your daily life, for example, if there's somebody who routinely upsets you, um, trying to think of them with a bit more compassion if you can't see any redeeming qualities in that person, you know, try to um, really wish them well, so that at least at that moment, you have a more pleasant thought in your mind, a more wholesome thought in your mind. And then you'll find that over time, you know, this uh, stillness, the wisdom, the metta does come up in these situations. Um, but it's really about the practice in daily life. So I think one way is to actually train the mind before you encounter difficult situations. And the other way is that when you're in those situations, um, noticing, you know, having the mindfulness to notice that you're hurting right now and to try and drop that idea of being right or wrong, the other person being wrong, and just to see, you know, the pain of that anger when it arises and perhaps to direct that compassion towards yourself. That can also be sometimes a very skillful thing to do at that moment. And that gives you a little pause, you know, before reacting. Yeah, I hope that makes a bit of sense. I mean, it's really trial and error, I would say. Um, but I think important in this question is to really forgive yourself if that's not always possible, because it won't always be possible even until you reach like the third stage of enlightenment. Only then does, you know, anger, irritation completely cease. So in the meantime, it's learning to work with these things as best we can. So may please ask, do, yeah. May I ask Shirley to unmute? Absolutely. Uh, do you want to continue? No, no, no. 
<laughs> Sorry. Please interrupt yes, me because I, I didn't know. notice. I think you've probably covered some of what I was sort of contemplating, but I think um, when we see, maybe when we're not affected personally, I, I think maybe we're conditioned to try and forgive people that have hurt us. But when we see people, you know, particular people, people in power who are actually, um, actually doing great harm to other beings and to the planet, it's very hard not to feel anger and a lot of bitterness and resentment. And in a way, we're, we're sort of, especially if you're trying to do something about it, you're with people who actually think that uh, anger is good. Um, for example, I've been involved in XR and so, you know, that one of their slogans is love and rage. And I don't like the rage bit. Mm, mm, um, yeah. but I do find myself feeling, you know, you, particularly when you're sort of in social media or, or Facebook or something and somebody puts something nasty. And I've always disciplined myself never put, to put the angry face. I always, yeah. always put the, the sad face, even though I do feel angry. I notice no. it inside, but I thought, no, I'm not going to put anything on social media that sort of feeds that anger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Help, but help um, feel the anger and the, oh, God, yeah. Mm. And it's, right. it's very difficult, you know, to, to feel, it, it's hard, you know, I, I know I should work on it, but, you know, I, I think the only way is, the best way is when you're actually feeling compassion. And when the mind's free of hate, you can notice how pleasant that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one really good way. That, and I've been sort of noticing that, and I just thought to think, you know, actually, when the mind's free of, def or relatively free of defilement, it feels so nice. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. to my mind, but yes, yeah. I do. But, um, yeah. yeah just very difficult when these and we're so conditioned um that righteous indignation is somehow okay yeah 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 i i don't think it ever helps right but right, I, right i can't say i've completely let it go but I'm trying yeah to. yeah 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 and i think it's true that in a sense you know these emotions might not help in the long run and yet at the same time it's about i think learning to accept that they will arise without sort of judging or stigmatizing them but perhaps to learn to work with them within ourselves before we take that step of like you say spreading it outward for example the anger button i i do exactly the same thing <laughs> as you actually and sometimes i wonder is that just um because sometimes i might feel anger but then i immediately change it to sadness which is more societally acceptable somehow and part of it is because of my own kind of lack of being able to fully accept my own rage which i'm sure is i know is there right but part of it is as you say like that i don't want to encourage that in others so i would prefer to acknowledge my own rage through the practice in the practice and <clears throat> recognize it as something that hurts me and yet it might be motivated by good things it might be motivated by a real love for the planet or by a lot of compassion and a real sense of like wanting justice fairness you know a non-discriminative world um wanting gender equity especially for nuns but for everybody right um and i don't only mean for women but for you know transgender people etc cetera, etc cetera. and so some of that's very wholesome but i think what i notice in myself is that the anger part can be there in the beginning but if i follow that or you know it's not a very good uh, emotion to encourage because it just drains the mind it exhausts the mind and it's much better if i can like allow that to be processed within myself with a lot of compassion self-compassion without trying to push it away but just learning how to relate to it and then it naturally turns into a more beautiful um, energy that can be used and that can actually sustain itself without tiring us out and I think that's one of the perhaps pitfalls of, in these groups that talk about rage 
it will drain you. <laughs> it will really drain you. And that's one of the reasons that a lot of activists need time out. So I think it's much better if we can process it as it comes and, you know, not, uh, not kind of allow it to the extent that we kind of celebrate rage. So if there can be that middle way between not repressing it, but also not uh, encouraging it, I think that is, but yeah, this is our task, right? To walk the middle path. I don't know if that makes any sense. Mira. May I ask Mira to unmute? Thank you. Uh, hello to everybody. I just was thinking about that sometimes anger is possibly a, a, a way, a, not a good way, to say I do not accept the circumstances. And uh, not being angry sometimes mean for the angry people is you accept every circumstance. Is it is it discrimination? All all the things that you just mentioned now, and I think the most most difficult way is to um, to not accept everything, but not be angry about the things how they are. Mm. Uh, this this is really difficult sometimes because anger is an energy. Even if it drains you out in the long term, for the first thing is you, know, you go on, on manifestations or demonstrations and things like that. There's often a lot of rage there, mm -hmm. and and when this don't happen, would every anything would ever change? I always think of this Greta Thunberg thing. How dare you? These how dare you moments, very angry and completely desperate. Yes, and but she moved a lot. Yeah. So where, where is the way to go? <laughs> but I think also yeah. she's drained out, you know? Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. She probably will burn out. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll just, um, sorry, I've muted you just because I think you finished and there's a bit of feedback on your um, sound. Um, yeah, I think this is a really interesting point and there is an instant amount of energy that comes with it, but I think we can use that with like I don't, for example, 2000, was it? Around 2000 when there was the protest against the Iraq war. Um, I remember feeling quite strongly about that, but not angry. I don't know that I ever felt angry. I actually went on that massive demonstration that was incredibly inspiring and uplifting. And there were all these people with like um, peace birds and like doves and, and there were like Korean monks and nuns with drums and the whole energy to me was just incredibly joyful. It felt like we're standing up for what's right. We feel really happy that we're doing the right thing, whether or not it works. It was like a massive protest. There were probably, I forget how many, but hundreds of thousands of people, they massively underreported it. You know, it took us like half an hour to get from sort of one bridge to the, I forget which bridge, but it was a very, very huge crowd. We were walking so slowly um, in this crowd, obviously before COVID without any masks. <laughs> and uh, it was just a joyful occasion. I don't remember, I don't think, for me personally, I don't think anger is a necessary ingredient. I also don't want to say that it shouldn't be there and that it's not okay to you know, to come from a place of anger if that's where you're at. But I think there's a misunderstanding that anger is necessary. I think there can be another energy, like the energy of compassion and love and joy in doing good and in standing up for what you believe in. Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree that indifference is a very bad and dangerous thing. Um, so yes, not accepting everything um, with a sense of indifference or passivity or kind of a sense of giving up like despondency and that can actually be very dangerous but at the same time understanding that we can only do so much and ultimately our actions may bring change but they may not and I think that's almost the unconditional part it's almost like in practice you know we practice meta because we trust that it's going to have some effect but if it doesn't we don't give up right we don't do it only because it's going to have an effect we do it because it's the right thing to do so for me the acceptance is more around I do my bit but I have to accept that the results may not be as I wish but that doesn't mean it's not worth doing my bit that doesn't mean it was worthless because it still puts out a very big message to people 
right? It still gets that dialogue going around, you know, climate catastrophe and the measures we need to take, even if it's not happening. But I think that, you know, if we have those expectations or those wishes that we do affect change and then it doesn't happen, that's when we burn out. You know, I can see it for myself just in a small way with the project. Like if I want this and this and this to happen by this and this time, I'm going to get exhausted. But if I say, well, never mind, I just do my bit and keep putting the drops in the jar. I take rest when I need to take rest. Then that's much easier and more sustainable longer term. Yeah, but yeah, it's not. Uh, it's a big topic, <laughs> and I definitely don't have all the answers for that. So Janaki is saying, if one trains their mind not to personalize anything, then one's free from anger, sensual pleasure, jealousy, etc. So the answer lies in not to personalize. Definitely helps. Liberation comes with that, and letting go takes place without any effort. That's how I think about it. Yeah, the problem is, of course, that we do personalize things if we have a sense of self, but certainly to try to remind ourselves that, you know, things are, in a sense, out of control. They're not, I mean, to me, that's part of anatta, part of non-self, is that, you know, we can't control even our own five candors, let alone anybody else's, right? But we can try to influence them in a sense of just putting in the causes and letting the results, you know, come by according to that with no choice right I mean the results will be the results <laughs> our only kind of influences in how we plant the causes and where we're coming from I think it's really important whether we're coming from a place of anger or jealousy or you know compassion and it can't be perfect it's not that you'll only have compassion and not any anger but at least put it on that side try and tip the balance as much as possible. So that's where the practice comes in, I think. And that's what makes Dhamma practitioners different from uh, other activists. You know, I think there's even, isn't there an element of extinction rebellion, which is like the meditators, surely? I think there's like a meditators quorum or something. They go about it slightly differently. They do some practice as well. Try and unmute you. Um, yes, I mean, I only really get involved with exile buddhists because i think right exile buddhists exactly uh, and but there are a lot of people from other faiths and it is all about love and kindness and connection and it's actually really it's, it's sort of i've sort of got more from it than actually the action in a way it's sort right. of my practice but they still sometimes use this i think even the exile buddhists use this thing uh, love and rage which I can't mm. I can't I can't quite I can't quite get. doesn't resonate and the, yeah that was the grief angle and I mean I, it was that was quite interesting because I was feeling that grief wasn't but you have to process I think the thing is that what they are doing is that they are holding all these feelings within their in their in, in this loving embrace yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So that's just such a useful practice, whether, you know, it's because yeah. of what we're doing. And uh, yes, there's some amazing people there. Great. Uh, um, so yes, and also um, what's been said is that the fact that people are actually sitting meditating does sort of diffuse. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, super. Situation. Although yeah. they professional you know well not professional people but people around to sort of diffuse the yeah 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 great the work on that but yeah. actually people are actually sitting meditating in the street yeah 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 um, it's really good it, yeah it, it does people actually like it which is which is lovely mm, great thanks yeah that's so important i think it comes around through practice as well in being able to distinguish the wholesome from the unwholesome mental states and yet give everything, like you say, a place to be, a place to exist. So just acknowledging that there may be sadness, there may be grief, there may be rage, it's it's not a bad thing. And then distinguishing, you know, whether um, I'm just experiencing this with an open heart or whether it's actually accumulating and getting exacerbated by my, the way I'm attending to it um, and knowing when to stop and direct the mind somewhere else. Yeah, diffuse, as you say. Yeah, so who else is commenting? Yeah. 
Yeah, very true. That's how Dhamma practitioners differ from other activists. Liberation and peace to oneself and the whole world comes from within oneself, one's own mind. So someone's also asking, is anger always bad? I don't think we ever have to say it's bad. I, I don't think it's helpful to judge it and label it. I think it's more, the Buddha never really talked about good and bad, or maybe in the translation it appears that way. But my understanding of the general thrust of Buddhism, it's like what causes suffering and what causes freedom and peace? You know, what's taking us more towards suffering and what's leading to the end of suffering? So we have to figure that out for ourselves. Mm. I think it's largely in the way we relate to these things. It can't be bad. And if we have this attitude that it's bad, we're going to just add negativity to it when it arises rather than be curious and be open to anger arising and find a compassionate response. Is it possible to be angry without the emotion? Yeah, that's another interesting one. I think we can appear angry when we're not. I remember this in Thailand years and years ago. Somebody had, uh, I think they'd actually cheated us out of a plane ticket or something quite serious. And um, we just come out of a meditation retreat, myself and an Israeli friend at the time that I was traveling with. And we went to, we felt very equanimous about the whole thing. We felt like it was all part of the fun, really. <laughs> but we also wanted to be quite firm with the travel agent and tell them that they needed to get us to the airport. I can't remember what it was. It might have been that the bus ride was cancelled or that, something like that, because we basically kind of shouted at them. And I'm not saying this is necessarily a good thing, but in that case, for some reason, we felt that we had to be really firm and we kind of shouted and said, you must give us a taxi. We demand that you send us by taxi or we miss our plane. And I did it very conscientiously without anger. And I know that because I could walk out and kind of laugh. I mean, now in retrospect, I don't know if I was a bit too firm, but at the time it seemed like that was appropriate. And I wonder if people, I don't know with um, Greta Thunberg, whether or not, um, you know, she, she probably is very angry and very afraid of, you know, the future because what have we done to this planet? Um, but it's not necessary to speak strongly that there must be anger there. There can be passion. There can be a real sense of love for justice, you know, a love for truth. Um, truth and peace and love don't always mean appearing sort of like a wet blanket like very soft and gentle sometimes it can appear firm it can appear strong you know we can use direct words mm? especially if that helps to, to wake people up you know some sometimes compassion is fierce it doesn't mean that it has anger behind it it just means that it has a certain conviction a certain grit you know it expresses itself clearly and without any kind of compromise and you know why you're doing it where you're coming from I think this is the key if we're angry without the emotion I think sometimes we can have a lot of suppressed anger as well so sometimes what we think of as depression or sadness could actually be suppressed anger um, that can be possible and we can also become quite numb if we do that a lot should Buddhists avoid anger as far as possible? I think we should, I mean, generally, I mean, I don't wanna say anybody should do anything. And I don't think there's such a thing as a Buddhist. I think we're all practitioners on the path and we're trying to practice the Buddha's teachings. Um, so in that case, we're all practicing, you know? So if we do something wrong, or if we do something harmful or that causes suffering, that's part of the practice, that's part of learning. Even the way that the precepts are expressed in Buddhism are that we undertake the training to abstain from, you know, unwholesome actions of body and speech. We undertake the training. So it's not one should not, it's more, I undertake the training to not. And that gives a lot of scope for making mistakes, falling down, getting back up, trying again, because there is a path, there is a training. I think it is very helpful to avoid expressing or throwing our anger on others, definitely. And also to avoid rolling in it and repressing it in ourselves. It's that middle way of learning to be with, learning to observe. Um, without reacting but it doesn't mean suppressing it just means learning to get close to the emotion and to know how long we can stay with that emotion what kind of attention how gentle how much space do we give it how long do we stay with it and notice if if your attention is starting to build it you know if your way of thinking is starting to build it maybe back up a little bit 
direct the mind to something else or just get up, walk, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, notice anger. I mean, the Buddha talks about it as a kind of poison because it does hurt, it hurts ourselves. And I think when we are able to be aware of anger and we do realize within ourselves as an experience that this is a painful emotion, we naturally start to let it go. Yeah, we naturally do. So it's a practice and a process. Anger can be good for cleaning energetically. I don't know. Again, it's an experiment. It's something that if that if that's true for you, then just go with that experiment. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I think the expression of it can sometimes feel like a relief, but I'm not sure it deals with the root. Someone else says anger is a detrimental emotional state. Yeah, certainly when we roll in it. So yeah, I mean, all these different, we've got a lot of different attitudes towards anger, isn't it? And I think it's really quite a fascinating subject <laughs> and uh, nobody has the answer for you, you know? It's not one thing. It might be that both are true. It could be that, you know, we can hold all of those things as true at different times for us. Yeah. But I don't remember any instance in my life where ang being angry with another person out of defilement, out of carelessness or, you know, just trying to vent. I don't think it's ever been particularly productive. So I would say that as a caveat, especially when we're in relationship with others. Yeah. Certainly not things like shouting or hitting or beating someone else. <laughs> Yeah, so be careful with it. You know, if you are angry, maybe wait a while until that has settled a bit before you approach someone and try to use language that um, is non-violent, even if you feel anger. So shall we go to the next sutta? Yeah. So this is called Patience Under Provocation, and this is one of the most you could say extreme suttas, describing the whole range of loving kindness and the extent to which we need to learn or the Buddha recommends us to learn to practice it. And it's also just an example. So here we go. <clears throat> First, it's about speech. Secondly, it's about what to do when you are being abused. So let's say monastics this time. There are these five courses of speech that others may use when they address you. So number one, their speech may be timely or untimely. Number two, true or untrue. Number three, gentle or harsh. Number four, connected with good or with harm. Number five, spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. In other words, aversion. So that's looking at the motivation. When others address you, their speech may be timely or untimely. When others address you, their speech may be true or untrue. When others address you, their speech may be gentle or harsh. When others address you, their speech may be connected with good or with harm. When others address you, their speech may be spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. Hence, monastics, you should train yourself thus. Our minds will remain unaffected and we shall utter no bad words. Here it says evil. Um, yeah, Ajahn Brahmali prefers the word bad, I think. I don't know. Either one is similar. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. We shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness. And starting with them, we shall abide pervading the all encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. This is how you should train monks or monastics. So again, that emphasis on it being a training and it's very interesting for me reading this out because when I read the first part about the different types of speech and words like hate, and then we move on to those beautiful words of loving kindness, those thoughts and reflections, 
it brings a completely different emotional response in me. It like uplifts my mind to, to read those beautiful words. And I think, you know, that's what it means to reflect, isn't it? You know, we can actually rehearse the words, if you like. We can rehearse them in our mind and we can get a sense for the feeling behind them of where it's pointing to, similar to what we actually do on the cushion when we practice metta. We can see how beautiful that would be. It's like elevating the mind, isn't it? It's creating a kind of high and noble mind. And the Buddha here is also pointing to the inevitability, I think, of being addressed sometimes in a harmful way, sometimes by people who are harsh or who have aversion in their mind. This is inevitable. And because of that, especially because of that, because we can't control it, we need to train. Our minds will remain unaffected. We shall utter no evil words. So that means we don't come back with the same. We don't allow people to bring us down to their level. Sometimes that takes a lot of restraint and sometimes keeping silent might be the best way. But then further, we shall abide compassionate for their welfare. So wouldn't it be wonderful if whenever we're approached in an angry or hostile way, compassion is the first thing that comes to mind, you know? Realizing this person's actually sick at this moment. They're not well, they're not seeing things straight. And they're suffering themselves, either now or later. And perhaps they'll suffer less if we don't retort back, if we don't make more of it. So we abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. And then the next little bit about pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness and starting with them, we shall abide pervading the all encompassing world. So this is how we practice. We spread the metta outward and unbounded. But it's interesting here because this is one example in the suttas of the Buddha actually recommending that we start with the difficult person. yeah, Or perhaps the good person also. You could say it's both because they may contact you with a beautiful mind, with a mind of loving kindness. So it's almost pointing towards us developing metta to those people in our lives and especially trying to nip it in the bud if, you know, Hostility is likely to arise in our mind. Try to practice metta and compassion towards that person before it gets ingrained. Are there any more thoughts about that paragraph that anybody would like to share? I can see someone's written something in here. Okay. This is another verse from the Dhammapada. I might not read that out right now because I don't want to give too much at once, but certainly please read it for anyone who wishes. So otherwise I shall continue. So monastics, suppose a person came with a hoe and a basket and said, I shall make this great earth to be without earth. <clears throat> they would dig here and there, strew the soil here and there, spit here and there, and urinate here and there, saying, be without earth, be without earth. <laughs> what do you think, monastics? Could that person make this great earth to be without earth? No, Bante, that means no venerable. Why is that? Because this great earth is deep and immense. It is not easy to make it be without earth. Eventually, that man, that person, would reap only weariness and disappointment. <laughs> so, too, monastics, there are these five courses of speech that others may use when they address you. Their speech may be timely or untimely, true or untrue, gentle or harsh, connected with good or with harm, and spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. <clears throat> Here in monastics, you should train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected. We shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. We shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness. And starting with them, we shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind similar to the earth. Abundant, exalted, immeasurable without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train monastics. So that's where the earth comes into it, that our mind should be 
like the great earth, deep and immense. You can't actually overturn that earth. You can't um, dig it up and throw it away because the loving kindness, the compassion is rooted in the mind so deeply that it doesn't matter even if somebody comes and digs and throws things here and there, spits here and there, urinates here and there. I don't know how you'd feel if you got spat at or urinated on. Hopefully that will never, ever happen. But imagine if you were just the earth. In a way, that's also depersonalizing it, isn't it? Because we are made up of the earth element among other elements. So can we be like the earth that never complains? Because if we are, and if that person cannot get a rise out of us, they'll reap only weariness and disappointment. So eventually that person will go away. And here comes the really extreme part because here we're even talking perhaps about life and death and perhaps the power of goodness to even follow us into the next life. So monastics, even if bandits were to sever you savagely limb by limb with a two-handled saw, one who gave rise to a mind of hate toward them would not be carrying out my teaching. Here in monastics, you should train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. We shall abide pervading them with a mind imbued with loving kindness and starting with them, we shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train monastics. So that's a, a very high bar to reach, a high standard. <laughs> it's also not encouraging us to just allow harm to be done, damage to be done to ourselves or anybody else. But this is talking about a situation in which it's inevitable that we're getting harmed. And it's talking about our mental response, okay? So it doesn't mean we don't try to avoid that harm or maybe we even try to get away, but it's about not giving rise to a mind of hate toward them. And I find this really fascinating. I mean, I've been thinking about this quite a lot and reflecting on this and uh, really ultimately, I think it's pointing toward the fact that being damaged, even killed physically, is not ultimately as harmful as developing a mind of hate. And I think here it is very helpful if we have at least quite a strong sense that there is such a thing as rebirth. You know, that we do have quite a, a deep understanding of karma and the results of karma, you know. To understand that we can be more harmed by our mental world than our physical world. I mean, even a simple example might be that say you have a headache or you have a broken heart or you have a lot of depression, loneliness, you know, grief, which one is more painful? It's the mental suffering that's more painful. And so this hate is something that will follow us if we give rise to a mind of hate. And of course, this is just showing that there's never really a justification for anger. And in that sense, I do agree with those who've said, you know, anger is not something we want to entertain, especially as people who try to follow the Buddha's path. Um, it's just that sometimes it's not helpful to beat ourselves up for being angry, for having anger, because it's natural that we'll have anger. It's inevitable until we're already anagamis. <laughs> OK, but we can learn to work with it in a way that leads to its pacification, its kind of settling and its uprooting eventually. Yeah. So perhaps we can see this more as not something to say, oh, I'm so terrible, I get angry over the slightest thing, but more kind of something to show us the extent and the power and the incredible strength of loving kindness practice to its fullest. Yeah, the actual scope of these Buddha's teachings that we can even face our death, even a violent death with a peaceful and loving mind, with compassion in our hearts, even if we're suffering you know, without anger and hate. So I like to think it more as an, of, as an encouragement and as a kind of measure of how sublime and how um, powerful these teachings really are, you know. And you can see this example in 
great people, great beings. I was going to say monastics, but it could be anyone who's practiced the path to a very deep level. You know, you can see that it's very hard to get anything that looks even like irritation out of them, no matter how they're treated, you know, they just don't get upset. You know, I've heard stories about people shouting at Ajahn Brown, you know, maybe people who are having a hard time in the monastery, they're shouting. And he just stands there and like waits until they're finished and, you know, just looks kind of a little bit, not really bemused, just a little bit, oh, surprised and kind of a tender compassion for that person, but without a sense of pity or judgment, just a very, um, yeah, you just feel like he's not, he's not, he's not taking it on. So it's really fascinating to be around people like this and to see that the more we practice, the more loving kindness and compassion we develop. So I hope that hasn't um, confused or given rise to any judgment in anybody. So that's from the Majjhima Nikaya number 21. You can read the whole thing. And there's quite a bit there to unpack. So any questions or comments or feedback on that? Maybe you have your own stories about. Uh... Yeah. Chanaki, can I ask you to unmute? Right. Yeah. Well, Chanda, I have Hi. a question. I have a question. I, I don't know. Um, I may be right or I may be wrong. I don't know. I'm just asking you for a verification. Uh, the people who often become angry aren't those the people who are usually unhappy yeah i would say so i would say that they're either unhappy before they get angry and that's why they're getting angry or if not they're certainly going to get more and more unhappy the more that anger is generated certainly because i don't know if it's possible to be angry and to be happy at the same time i would say not um you know the buddha very definitely says that it's not possible to have loving kindness whilst you're angry so if you have a mind without loving kindness for that moment even or maybe for even a few hours or even days, right? Then I don't really see how you can be particularly happy. Um, I think a happy mind comprises loving kindness and peace and, you know, an absence of anger. That's kind of part of the definition of happiness, I would say. So, yeah, but it's helpful in the way that you're putting it as well, that, you know, they might be unhappy people and that's why they get angry. And it's also a very good uh, reason to try to make sure we're as happy as can be <laughs> to work on our own happiness. We're much less likely to be angry if we actually have a sense of contentment and well-being. We're less yes. likely to want to compromise that as well. Yes, and we can feel sorry for those people as well. Exactly. Exactly, yes. That's a very important part of your point, that if we realise they're unhappy, you know, either they were or they will be, certainly, even if they don't realize it, then, uh, yeah, this is why when we practice and we see, we learn about the nature of the mind, it's much easier to be compassionate towards people. Because we know it's impossible. We know from our own experience that it's not possible to be angry and to be happy. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for your comment. It's always lovely to hear from you with so many insights. So. Uh, I've done most of the talking today, so please do take this time now, the last five minutes or so, to uh, feedback anything you wish, if you have struggles with anger, if you have examples maybe of dealing with anger, either successfully or not. It would be really nice to hear from you. <coughs> May I ask James to unmute? Hi, James. So we'll go to James and Miriam, and I think that will probably be all we have time for. We'll see. Hi. Hi. I'll start, I always find this the bit being cut limb from limb kind of disturbing, really. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's sort of a hard, challenging read. And yeah. Kind of hard to explain exactly, but one of the ways I think of it is that if the bars so incredibly high like that 
then maybe it makes it sort of easier to put up with the or to to not get angry about the little things. Yes. You know? It's like yes. if I'm to be expected to if even if I'm severed limb from limb to be uh, to be okay with it. Yeah. Then if something little happens, like someone speaks harshly to me or annoys me, then that yeah. actually seems quite manageable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I definitely think the Buddha's giving us a perspective here, definitely. And it's not that we put up with it, it's just that we don't develop a mind of hate. It's like it's almost like saying, why do that? Even if you're going to die, don't do that. It's not worth it. So yeah, quite right. Why should we do it for such small things? Yeah, it can be inspiring. It can be inspirational, certainly. Good. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll try and get to both Miriam and Yasmin, because I don't know if Yasmin's spoken before. Hi. <clears throat> Should we get to Yasmin first? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Yasmin, could you unmute, please? Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Ajahn. Hello. Um, yes, it's quite interesting about talking about anger. How would you deal with children when they're very angry all the time or when they felt like... Um, they they um when you tell them then they get angry and they start uh develop guilt or uh, they get frustrated because they can't control their anger mm. or they use statement like i hate myself for mm. being this. so how would you teach a child to to not have that mm, that self guilt and kind yeah. of feeling they shouldn't be angry I think um, I mean I'm not a mother but I think as a mother or father you would have an important role to play in just um, validating their feelings I think first of all saying you know I see you're angry I understand that it's painful isn't it you know it's annoying isn't it <laughs> like mm -hmm. how do you feel how do you feel right now like do you feel it in your chest do you feel it in your tummy like what how do you feel and if they're not at that point where they can like listen or communicate maybe it's just about having a safe space for them to actually feel what they feel and express that anger um, without being punished, a feeling that they're not going to be punished and that you're still there for them just the same, you know? I mean, if they're really being kind of very um, angry and aggressive, it might be wise to just say, well, look, I still love you and I can see you're angry and when you calm down, let's have a chat, you know, <laughs> something like this. Um, so I guess keeping that sense of loving kindness, at the same time, respecting your own, um boundaries there I mean I think sometimes parents probably cave in a bit when the child gets angry and that's not necessarily a good thing to do because then they're you know breaching boundaries so I think sometimes it's just like okay well this is what I've decided and I'm sorry that you're angry but you know how does that feel for you right now I know it's difficult but I'm here for you you know but I'm not going to change my mind. <laughs> so I think just giving that consistent model of like unconditional love. Yeah. I don't know if that's a few things. I mean, if we had longer, I'd probably ask some mothers to, to speak because I haven't actually had to deal with a difficult teenager or a child. I know I was a difficult teen. Well, I wasn't really, but I know that, um, you know, if, if I would have had somebody there to say, oh, it's okay, I love you anyway, it's natural that you'll feel more anger when you're a teenager, the hormones are all over the place. That would have been so helpful, you know, rather than sort of feeling I was bad or I was like letting other people down. Because mm -hmm. these, these emotions are really natural and unavoidable. And sometimes it's part of a person finding themselves, testing the boundaries, and then later as a teenager, finding out who they are and what they want to think and what they want to do. So I think we have to allow people to feel those things as they discover who they are in life. Yeah, I guess the 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 interesting part is that he can he can feel it, but uh, that's why after that the feeling become guilty. Mm. You know, he he will run away and then you will feel upset about it. Why he yeah. cannot control his emotion? Okay, yeah, yeah. You. And then you say, oh, I hate myself for... Oh, yeah. So you just felt like, oh, okay. Right. You could... You, uh, you could... 
yeah maybe you could ask him like how he'd feel if it was his friend like if his friend got angry and somebody he loves you know if somebody he loved got angry what would he do wouldn't he comfort them and tell them it's okay Mm -hmm. um that kind of thing and also for you to just say um you know it's okay you don't need to feel bad about that I mean it hurts it's painful but it's normal and everybody feels this way from time to time so but yeah uh, that's a good uh, advice thank you complicated yeah thanks <laughs> thanks for the question it's really a great question and it's yeah it's complicated you know all these emotions are painful I think as parents too it must be hard to see children suffer in any way but we have to let them have those emotions I think even the guilt you know go through it so last question for comment we'll come to Miriam Miriam Jan, Jan, please Hello, thank you. Um, I just wanted to share that uh, lately I noticed um, I was very angry and when I contemplated, so what's behind the anger of um, going into the feeling, I noticed that there was actually sadness. It was, mm. and I noticed this um, sometimes that behind an anger is often another feeling and um, yeah. often sadness. Yeah. And so it, it was beautiful to notice, oh, okay, it's because actually I want, um, for example, that person to like me. And she, right. um, yeah. yeah, and it was very touching to notice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? It's a softening around the anger when we realize it's a kind of, it's almost like a mask for something a bit more vulnerable and tender that the anger sort of feels safer at first, but then if we're able to be with it, we can sometimes penetrate through to what's really the emotion that we're in a sense trying to avoid, right? We don't want to feel that sadness, so we feel anger. It's almost like, it looks like we're angry with the person or we're sad about something, but in a way we're just angry with the sadness itself. And the, um, when we can like come closer to it and experience it and, you know, give ourselves that comfort and that care for, that we need, then uh, it starts to dissolve. So that's probably why you felt touched. Yeah, the heart is a little bit softer. So that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Great. And I'll just read the comment from Ming there. So she says, sometimes I say, am I sure to lessen some of my irritation before it becomes very difficult? Yeah, that's very wise as well. That's very wise as well. It's undermining the thinking process because we can feel like, oh, somebody's saying something against me or about me. Am I sure? You know, sometimes that's not what they're saying. <laughs> um, it's really good. It's really good. It's like uh, not believing in our thoughts and not also believing or being too swayed and led by our emotions as well. It's like, yes, we can validate them. We can say, okay, I hear you. I feel you. But at the same time, not to get sucked in by those because they do pass. So that's great. Anything that can put the brakes on is very helpful. Great, so thank you everybody. And I think I'll hand to whoever wants to say a few words to end. Me, yes. Uh, first of all, I'd, uh, I'd like to say that it's been really lovely being here together with everyone. Uh, this evening and on previous Fridays and having the opportunity to hear and discuss the Dhamma together. I, I personally tend to feel quite tired at the end of a week, but I know that being here is always really nourishing and perhaps that resonates with other people here uh, too. So thank you very much to Venerable Chanda for so generously offering us this opportunity. And we too can show our generosity through the practice of Dhamma. So as always, uh, this evening's Sutta discussion is offered on a donation basis. And if you would like to offer Dana, then anything you are able to give to support Venerable Chanda and the Anukampa Bikuni project will be very much appreciated. Uh, the link to the website where you can find out how to do this is in the chat box. And you can also find more information about the project there and the peer-led events that will be taking place while Venerable Chanda is away on retreat. So I just want to wish you a good, good journey to America and oh. that the retreat goes well. And thank, thank you. Thank you very much. 
<laughs> thank you so much Kelly thank you for those uplifting words and uh, yeah I'll be going it was a good reminder to let you know that I will be going hopefully if I can get by without catching Covid I'll be getting on an aeroplane on the 20th uh, of this month to America so the plan is to have some retreat time and then to visit some bikuni friends in California and uh, so for February there will be no sort of discussion but we will have the Tuesday evening meditations and also Manori who I'm not sure if she's here today but yes she's there she's right there I have seen you actually many times tonight <laughs> she'll be leading the um, meta chanting on a Wednesday in my absence and yeah and then in March I'm hoping to come back to do some sort of discussions. I'll be zooming in from California. So internet might not be quite as good, but um, the scenery should be much better. <laughs> and um, it will happen at a slightly earlier time. So check the website, because I think I'm starting them from about mid-March to give myself a week to get over there and come off retreat. And I think they're starting around mid-March and um, it's a, a half an hour earlier so that's 6 45 uk time okay and that'll give me time for lunch over there great so really sweet to read your messages so much mudita so much happiness and yes i am actually going to yes pretty much almost janaki you're almost correct i'm going to fly into new jersey be with the buddhist insight for about 10 days then I'm going to Forest Refuge in Massachusetts for a retreat with one of my main teachers who's uh, maybe not there in person I'm not sure uh, otherwise he'll zoom in the teachings and then I'm going to um, not to Aya Tataloka's place but to Aya Santusika and Aya Chittananda's place they're just two bikinis in a small redwood forest uh, Aya Chittananda's taught for us before She's Vietnamese American. She's very sweet. And hopefully she'll join me as well as a surprise, which is not a surprise anymore. But you know, you never know. So, <laughs> so you're all wishing me well, but I would like to wish you all well as well. Um, and take care. And please do come along to the peer-led groups if you can, because it just helps keep the community ticking and it helps support one another. And it can be really nourishing. There'll also be Sunday evening. Uh, Dhamma talks they'll be recorded talks by myself and Leah will have those she'll host the meeting so basically it's the first and third Sunday of the month from I think next Sunday isn't it yeah next Sunday so you join you sit together in meditation then there's a talk and then there's some discussion and also an opportunity to get together in little groups and people really find that nourishing so give it a go it might not be your thing but you never know if you don't try so wonderful I think we'll unmute you now thanks for your lovely messages and uh and we'll wave goodbye take care everyone